Our program tonight is called In the Footsteps of Bud Owens. I was introduced to this story several years ago, and it's a really incredible story of courage and dedication and commitment and human kindness. And in the end, you feel better for having understood the story. So we have several members of Bud Owens' family here tonight. And I want to introduce our presenter, who is Warren, Walter Kara, sorry, I'm going to rename you, with the 381st Bomb Group. Yay, okay, clap. And rather than me try to create an introduction, I'm going to let Wa um, I'm gonna, Warren, I'm going to get his name right in a minute, Warren tell you a lot about himself and about why he's here. So please welcome Warren Kara. Thank you. I want to thank Deborah and, of course, all of you for having me here tonight. Uh, uh, tonight is accumulation of uh, a number of years of research, uh, study, and getting to know the person we know as Bud Owens. And I'd like to talk to you about how this story began. It, we're going to discuss a, a lesser known part of World War II, and uh, that's uh, the uh, status of being an evader in a foreign land. I'm sure some of you probably have relatives that were evaders. Some of them were very successful evaders and some of them were not. But a great number of us don't really understand the nature and the meaning of being an evader. I think all of us can appreciate being an airman in 1942, 1943 was a very dangerous business. But think for a moment how dangerous it was in the skies compared to being a airman on foot in France, the Netherlands, or in Belgium. It was a very, very scary time, and uh, we had several thousands of airmen that went through this experience. <clears throat> this story began like a lot of stories do about World War II when I asked my father, what did you do in World War II? I think some of you probably asked that same question of your fathers, or your grandfathers. And uh, my father was not reticent to talk about World War II, but he, he seemed to hesitate. And I didn't learn why until a number of years. But uh, he eventually told me that he was uh, an Air Force officer, had been trained as a uh, pilot in California, uh, uh, training schools, and that uh, he uh, joined the 8th Air Force on the 8th of February 1942 and uh, was eventually assigned to the 381st Bomb Group. Raw, raw. Okay. <laughs> His experience in World War II was relatively short compared to some others. On his seventh mission, his aircraft was shot down over France. And uh, unfortunately, uh, only a handful of his crew survived that crash. And uh, it was from that basis then that I was asked, please tell me who my crew was. I think uh, some of us has probably had parents or grandparents who flew with crew members they didn't know. This is the circumstance in which my father was under. He uh, was... Uh, uh, last, uh, he had last minute substitutions on his plane. Uh, five gunners suddenly showed up at the side of the airplane. They got on, went to their positions, and they took off. He did not even know their name. So when he eventually got around to writing his escape and evasion report, he couldn't name anybody except maybe four people in the entire airplane. And just prior to his death in 2003, he had asked me, Warren, please find out who my crew members were. I owe them that amount of respect. And so I pretty much have spent a great deal of my spare time just trying to find out who these folks were. 
And in the process of doing so, I uh, found uh, about our subject matter tonight, Sergeant, Staff Sergeant Bud Owens. Bud Owens was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He was a waste gunner on my father's B-17, and uh, he was uh, inducted into the Flexible Flying or dry, or Gunnery School in Fort Myers, Florida in September of 1942 and then was sent to the garden spot of training in the Army Air Force's Pyote Army Air Force Base in Texas. Are there any of you familiar with Pyote? Pyote! Rattlesnake Air Base and the laughing stock of the Army Air Forces. It was actually one of the first operational training bases that was put together. It was a uh, uh, base of approximately 20,000 acres. It was owned by the University of Texas, and it was built from scratch and in operation in less than 18 months. And it was called the Rattlesnake Base simply because they uncovered thousands of rattlesnakes when they were building it. One of the hazards of being a uh, pilot or a crew member at Pyote was when you uh, knocked off for the night and went to bed, before you got up in the morning, you always shook your boots out because uh, the rattlesnakes liked the warmth that was still in the boots. And uh, regrettably, uh, a number of airmen found out what it's like to get bitten by a rattlesnake. So uh, just keep that in mind if you ever go out to West Texas. <clears throat> This project started uh, with me attempting, as I said, trying to find the crew members of my father's airplane. Uh, as I uncovered these, went through the National Archives, and also spent a great deal of time speaking with French historians and the British archives, I began to develop a story of who these people were. The airplane crashed on July 4th, 1943, in a village called La Colonche, which is in uh, the Department of Orne in Normandy. And uh, as a consequence, uh, uh, I was focusing most of my research in that area. I did meet and met with and communicated with a number of historians. And one of the mysteries that I was investigating is what happened to the gunner named Bud Owens. One of the crew members of my father's plane had thought that Bud Owens had been shot by a sentry uh, while he was escaping over the Pyrenees Mountains, but he wasn't sure. He wasn't even sure that Bud had even escaped the plane. You know, U.S. Army did not know what had happened to him. And the first sign that I knew Bud had survived was a French farmer sent to me Bud Owens' dog tech. The dog tags were typically given by the evading airmen to the families that took care of them because the U.S. Army Air Forces dropped leaflets in France saying if you took care of an airman or sheltered him, you will be compensated at the end of the war. And as proof that you had sheltered someone, you handed over the dog tag that he had given you. At that point in time, I felt it was necessary. I had to find the Owens family. The dog tag, of course, gives the hometown of the individual. And regrettably, the Owens name is probably the most common in America. <laughs> I can tell you it is the most common in Pittsburgh. <laughs> I sent 380 some odd letters to every Owens family I could find. And uh, it was getting rather, rather desperate because I occasionally had a nice Samaritan write me back, this guy sounds real nice, but he ain't part of our family. And uh, <laughs> finally, I got a letter from a James Owen or Jim Owen. It was Bud Owen's youngest brother. And uh, he said, you've got the right guy. And I says, well, I've got some information for you, too, and I have some artifacts. And I had the opportunity to present back to the Owens family uh, the dog tag that I had retrieved from the French farmer in France. And uh, I, I can't imagine what that felt like to get a piece of, of a person that you hadn't seen since 1943. 
And the family really didn't know what happened to Bud, even to the day that I met with him in Pittsburgh. And uh, that's one of the, I guess, one of the most rewarding things of being a researcher uh, uh, concerning evaders or POWs and things is that while there's a lot of tragedy and a lot of sorrow, there's also a great deal of reward. And uh, I'm not a historian by profession, uh, but uh, I certainly can understand when a historian finds something that no one else knows, it, it really warms your heart. I want to get into a little bit about the background about Bud Owens and the group he was in and what happened to him, and then we're going to go into a video. The video was produced as a result of some uh, articles I had published in World War II publications as well as uh, on Internet sites that concern themselves with World War II. And it uh, sparked the interest of a young Belgian named Gert van den Bogart. Mr. Bogart was a World War II Normandy guide. He was about 30 years old, and he made his living escorting uh, former GIs who had made the Normandy invasion in 1944. He was a battlefield guide. Gert had other ambitions, however. He wanted to have some meaningful way of thanking the literally thousands of French, Belgian, and Dutch helpers who helped American airmen and uh, some soldiers to evade the Germans and find some kind of success in reaching Spain. Gert wanted to find a way of being able to thank those people and doing so in such a way that it would last forever in the minds of anyone who saw the video and anyone who uh, would look at it in the future. So I uh, cooperated with Gert and started providing him with a timeline of all the evaders that came out of my father's airplane. So let's take a look at the group he was in. And uh, I see I've already jumped too many slides, so I'm going to move back here. Let's talk about the state of the war in 1942 and 1943. Uh, 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 obviously, most of us weren't around in those days, but uh, those, 1942 was a dark day, uh, dark days for most Americans because we'd had a number of setbacks uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the war. Uh, for example, all of continental Europe was occupied by Nazi Germany. Japan occupied nearly all of the Pacific. England was starting to become a staging point for Allied bombardment uh, of the Axis. The U.S. homeland was starting to gear up industry for the prosecution of the war. U.S. Navy finally had a good victory at Midway. Some call it the turning point of the war. I consider it probably uh, the, the booster that you know I think the U.S. Navy needed. Uh, we started our invasion of the Solomon Islands in 1942. The Russians finally stopped the uh, Germans at Stalingrad in January 1943. The Allied invasion, invasion of uh, Sicily began in 1943, and of course we invaded North Africa in 1942. The Japanese were driven out of the Gilbert Islands in November of 1943, and the U.S. Army Air Forces were beginning to suffer the heaviest losses they had incurred in the uh, late summer and fall of 1943. So that was the state of the war at that point in time. And this is when my father, Bud, and all his crewmates joined the war. Let's talk about the U.S. Army Air Forces in Europe at that time. Uh, they were given unity of command, that is, being able to be an independent entity in March of 1942. The massive training effort had to begin, and uh, part of my studies have been looking at the number of training facilities in the United States, and they truly are mind-boggling. Uh, there was probably 500 different Army Air Forces training facilities throughout the country. For pilot training and navigation training, for example, most were in the southern United States. But bases like Chinook and Scott in Illinois and in uh, Massachusetts and other places taught technical skills. 
And uh, of course, Florida was used a great deal for flexible gunnery because you could get out over the ocean very, very quickly. The, the training aspect of it was incredible. And uh, suddenly people found themselves as trainers and as educators who never dreamed they would be in that kind of a job. Dozens and dozens of new fighter and bombardment groups were being formed. Suddenly, 25-year-old men in the Army Air Forces were colonels, believe it or not, and an old man at 25, because most, like my dad, was 19 years old. So you had a very, very young cadre of people being led by a slightly older cadre of people, and it was learn as you go. And there was a great deal of errors and mistakes made, and I think any of you that have looked at the history uh, of the uh, bombardment of Germany in 1943 will know that a lot of rethinking had to take place after the losses that took place at Schweinfurt and some of the other locations. We started uh, sending Army uh, Air Force bomb groups to England in 1942, but most started in 1943. Uh, there was no really organized bombing of enemy targets until the summer of 1943. There had been bombing before that, but uh, a, uh, groups and organizations of any significant size uh, didn't really occur until the summer of 1943. The Army Air Forces took the brunt of European conflict until the invasion of 1943, and that's one thing I think a lot of Americans don't appreciate is uh, just how deadly being an airman was in 1942, 43, and 44 uh, in Europe. Uh, I don't think that appreciation is there. Let's talk about the 381st Bomb Group, rah, rah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was formed in 1943. Uh, they trained at our favorite base at Piote uh, in Texas. Uh, they did additional training in Colorado and Kansas, and it was made up of four uh, squadrons, the 532nd, 33rd, 34th, and 31st Bomb Squadrons. They were deployed to England on the 20th of May, 1943. Their base was at a former RAF field called Ridgewell. Ridgewell is just south of Cambridge, if you're familiar with the geography of Essex, England. And the total complement of the bomb group, uh, when they got there, was about 1,500 personnel. That would be, of course, your air crews and then your uh, armorers and other support groups, medical, you know, that sort of thing. So it uh, was a fairly compact group, uh, and it had about uh, 15 planes per squadron and it was commanded by a 28-year-old full colonel named Joseph Nazaro. Mr. Nazaro had a distinguished career in the Air Force. He eventually ended up uh, commanding Strategic Air Command, and he also was uh, commanding general of all Pacific forces before he retired. But he was a young hotshot football player that they took from lieutenant to full colonel in three years. That wasn't the military I was a part of, I'll tell you that. Here's just a couple of photos of what the base looked like. It was a very typical uh, American base uh, with a uh, control tower in the, uh, usually the southern end of the field. Uh, it had the typical triangle uh, format, format for the uh, runways. Runways are about six to 7,000 feet long. And uh, each of the bomb squadrons had a corner of the field for their own disbursements. The particular uh, B-17 that we're interested in talking about is uh, one that uh, had the designation of 4229-928. This was a B-17 that arrived at the 381st Bomb Group a little bit later than the others. The reason was is that uh, it was uh, designated to be part of a movie, and uh, it uh, was spent about three weeks in Hollywood. Uh, as a uh, movie prop for a World War II propaganda film, which I don't know which one it was, but uh, uh, before it came to England. I'd like you to meet the crew of 4229-928. The first pilot was a First Lieutenant Olaf Ballinger. He was from uh, Warren, Ohio. 
Second Lieutenant Paul McConnell was a navigator. Second Lieutenant George Williams of Warren, Ohio was the bombardier. My father, uh, although a first pilot, was on this particular instance a co-pilot to Lieutenant Ballinger. In the second line, the uh, top turret gunner and the engineer was uh, Brian Gronstel. He was from Los Angeles. We'll skip over the middle guy for a minute. The uh, <clears throat> radio man was, uh, oh gosh, Tech Sergeant, ah, mm -hmm. Yeah, Lane. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, John Lane. He was uh, originally a Canadian and uh, had moved to the United States as a uh, youngster, and he had resided in Dellen, Florida. Oops. Albert Wackerman was the ball turret gunner. He was from Salinas, California. Harry Bauscher was the uh, one of the waist, right waist gunner. He was from Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, William Howell, the tail gunner, was from Goldsboro, North Carolina. And in the center is the subject of tonight's presentation, left waist gunner Francis Edward Bud Owens. He was a staff sergeant, as were all the gunners. Uh, Gronstel, or rather, uh, yeah, Gronstel and Lane were tech sergeants. And uh, uh, the crew, as I said, most half, almost half of them were substitutes on this airplane and had never met any of the officers that they flew with. Which complicated things because uh, when you're on the interphone trying to communicate, you didn't know the names and so you had to call out the positions. Right waist gunner, look out over here, this, that, and it, it hindered communication somewhat. The uh, crew, most of the crew of 42, 29, 928 have participated in about seven missions when the July 4th fireworks mission was designated. It was supposed to be an all-out effort to bomb the aero engine uh, plant in Le Mans, France. They made engines for Focke-Wulf 190 aircraft. And a number of uh, uh, bomb groups from the 1st Air Division were designated to be part of this uh, raid. Uh, all, most all of them all came out of Essex, England. They grouped over the upper English Channel, then went down the channel, and then turned south, directly uh, south uh, of uh, Cherbourg, and went to their uh, initial point, which was Laval in the uh, Department of Warren. They would then turn 90 degrees and uh, approach Le Mans bomb and then basically return back north to their bases. There was other groups involved in this mission. They aren't shown on this map, but they went on to bomb some of the submarine pens in uh, Nantes and police as well as uh, some training facilities uh, further south. 29-928, just as it reached Laval to make its turn, received a rather close flak burst directly under the radio room. It didn't seem to impact the performance of the aircraft, but shortly after, my father told me that all the crew in the back of the plane had no oxygen. So the flak burst had evidently severed all the oxygen lines to the back. It's decision time. There was some probability of the crew suffering from anoxia, and I presume most of you know what that is. It's oxygen deprivation. It can cause uh, death, uh, but it frequently results in either dopiness or unconsciousness. The doctrine of the Air Force at that particular time was that Regardless of what happened to your aircraft, if it was capable, you stayed with the formation. So what do you do? You've got a crew in the back of your airplane that can't breathe. You've got orders that you are to stay in formation. It is just one of thousands of moral dilemmas pilots and other officers in those planes had to deal with every day. And I don't know that any of you have ever had to deal with that kind of a question, but think about it for a minute. What do you do?
Lieutenant Ballinger made the decision that he wanted to save his crew. He was not unanimous in that decision. Uh, all the other officers on the airplane insisted that the plane stay on course, perhaps move to the low group uh, to get a little bit lower. They were flying at 21,000 feet, but uh, the uh, Lieutenant Ballinger, who was a first lieutenant, and the others were just seconds, uh, he prevailed, and they started to return back to England at the altitude of about 10,000 feet. It unfortunately turned to be the death sentence for a number of the crew and for the aircraft itself. Uh, they were beset uh, by a group of BF-109G fighters that were based in a city of Alencon, which was only about 25 miles away from their course. And uh, they spent the next 100 miles taking cannon pot shots at the aircraft, slowly destroying it. The aircraft tried to fire back. They had already burnt out their guns and had run out of ammunition. And so there was no defense, whatever. And uh, at 12 noon, the plane became unflyable. The uh, rear horizontal stabilizer folded up into the uh, tail and the plane started a climb that it would not come out of, and so the bailout order was hit. In my research, I had the unique opportunity to actually find out who the German pilot was that shot down my father's plane. And uh, I actually spoke with his son, uh, and uh, it was a very interesting conversation. Uh, I don't know how many people would be comfortable doing that. Certainly, Fritz Karch, who was a lieutenant in the German Luftwaffe, uh, would, was not very keen to speak with me, particularly after he learned that I knew he shot my father down out of the sky. <clears throat> However, I tried to assure him that, you know, like all Army officers and Air Force officers, there, there is duty and he had his duty, and my father had his. And that these are consequences of war that we all have to accept, and that I did not have a personal feeling of retribution or grudge against him. Uh, I just wanted to find out what he was thinking. And he eventually opened up and said, well, you know, I shot down 49 bombers in my career. So I'm dealing with a multiple ace here. And he is the only survivor of his particular wing, which is Jagdjus Veda Zwei, which was the old Richthofen uh, unit that uh, Baron von Richthofen used to fly with in World War I. So the unit had a very, very proud you know, history, and he was the last surviving member of that. And the only reason he thinks he survived the war is that at the end of the war, he was based outside of Berlin and had been told to go up and try to fight off the Russians who were at the front door. He was given an old, old 109. That was the only plane that would fly. And it was a hand crank job. Just like old Model Ts, they had hand cranks at the side of them. And the hand crank kicked back and broke his wrist, and he couldn't fly. And he thinks that's the only reason he survived the war. But he gave me some very interesting insights. Uh, uh, the, the fallacy of the uh, uh, invincibility of the B-17, I think, was uh, dramatically told to me. He said he never had any problems shooting down uh, bombers. Uh, he said the only gun position that ever gave him trouble was a tail gunner. And he practiced head-on attacks. He said that was the easiest way. The amount of firepower that could be put forward in a B-17 was minuscule. The bottom of his aircraft was armored, so he would invert it, fly upside down, and then uh, fire his cannons, and usually try to destroy the cockpit of, of the B-17, and then fly down underneath it. And it says he was successful 49 times. So uh, obviously he understood the tactics. But it 
added a new element of understanding of what World War II was all about. And uh, if you have any relatives that uh, uh, might have been in the similar situation, uh, uh, I'd be glad to help you try to find the German pilot because those records exist. Their claims of victories were very easy for me to find. They're in German archives. They're actually now in the U.S. archives. And if you've got a date and a location, I can probably find the pilot that shot your loved one down. Let's look at the aftermath of this. <clears throat> Ballinger tried to hold the plane in the air as long as he could. He finally gets to exit the plane at about 2,000 feet. The plane crashes into an apple orchard in La Colonche, which is in the Department of Orne, around 12.40 in the afternoon. Sergeant Wackerman and Sergeant Bauscher were killed in the plane uh, by enemy fire. Lieutenant Williams had a most regrettable incident that cost him his life. Williams was a bombardier, as you'll recall, and he was helping the navigator uh, shoot the front gun. And a B-17F, you had one forward gun. And the ammunition belts in this particular plane, the cans are up above, and the belts ran over your head and down into the machine gun. One of the belts caught uh, the bombardier's D-ring on his parachute and opened it up inside the plane. What do you do? Well, my father was down in the compartment with the navigator supervising the bailout of uh, everyone, and he said that he remembers a lecture he got at Douglas Army Airfield back in 1942, that if your parachute opened inside a plane, simply gather it to your body, jump out of the plane, and throw it out, and it'll open up for you. Uh, I think our bombardier was a little skeptical of that, and... Uh, he did remember that the plane normally carried uh, a uh, spare parachute. So he decided he was going to get that spare parachute. Well, here's the irony uh, uh, that occurs in many cases in World War II of what goes in, goes on at the back of an airplane doesn't necessarily coordinate well with what's going on in the front of the airplane. You'll recall the flak burst hit just below the radio man's position. Sergeant Owens, who was one of the waste gunners, was just about to bail out of the plane when he said to himself and the others who were gathered there, has anyone seen Sergeant Lane, the radio man? No one had. So Sergeant Owens decides to go back up to the front of the plane, and in a B-17, the radio room is right behind the uh, bomb bay, he opened the door, and it's an inferno in there. The plane, all the radio equipment is burning up, uh, and there is Sergeant Lane laying on the floor with a rent in his body from his knee all the way to his shoulder. He had been ripped wide open by that flak burst, but he was still alive. So... Sergeant Owens dragged him to the back of the plane, grabbed the spare parachute, clipped it on him, threw him out of the airplane, and grabbed the D-ring and opened the parachute as he left the plane. Sergeant Lane was captured almost immediately, but the Germans saved his life. And he lived another 44 years thanks to Sergeant Owens. So you can see something about the character of Sergeant Owens already starting. There was another incident in Sergeant Owens' life shortly after arriving at Ridgewell. They uh, had the practice in those days of loading fused bombs into the bombers. Uh, it was a regrettable practice that was shortly stopped. But uh, Owens was cleaning the guns on my father's airplane when the bomber next to them in the revetment suddenly just went up in a gigantic poof. Bombs are starting to go off everywhere, and shrapnel was flying everywhere. Owens exited the plane and was running to save his own life when he noticed 
one of the armorers, armorers laying under the wing of the plane that had blown up with a very large compound fracture. His femur was literally a foot out of his body. Without thinking about it, Owens grabbed him and dragged him to safety. And as a result of that, he was awarded the Soldier's Medal. So you can see a pattern starting to develop here, and which made, for me, Owens a major project. I had to learn more about this young man. <clears throat> After they had all parachuted, of course, the, the crew scattered. They, that's what you do, is you scattered, and you look at this very inadequate silk map they gave you that showed Europe and kind of outline, and the word was, you head south. Well, criminy, you know, you're, you're sitting there wearing these heavy clothes, big heavy boots, and you have not a clue where you are. And uh, as a consequence, uh, a lot of these guys suffered quite a bit. And uh, Owens was certainly not, was not uh, one of them. Uh, uh, he managed to find help in, with a farmer's family, but Sergeant Gronstel was captured, and uh, he was severely cut up. Uh, when you leave the uh, aircraft in the B-17, they always tell you to go ahead first. There's a reason for that. Uh, he decided to go out feet first, and he found himself being scraped along the bottom of the entire length of the aircraft before he was free of it. As a consequence, he was just shredded with all the rivets and things that uh, he had run up against. Uh, Sergeant Lane, we've already talked about, he was uh, very incapacitated. And uh, so those, those folks were uh, are captured. And uh, my father, Sergeant uh, uh, Owens, and Mr. Ballinger uh, all went their separate ways. There can be some humor in escape and evasion. Uh, my father landed in what is called the Andane Forest, and he took shelter in a uh, forester's cabin, and uh, he was trying to figure out what he's going to do, and there was a farm about 50 yards away from this building, and so he watched it all day long, and uh, he uh, was getting very thirsty. This is July now in France. It's hot. And finally the sun sets and he says, I've got to get something to drink. So he decides, I'm going to take a chance. And so he goes up to the door, knocks on the door, and the Frenchman opens it up. And the Frenchman immediately starts talking in French. And of course, my father doesn't speak any French. But through pantomime and little puppets and things like that, he managed to indicate that he had a degree of thirst that was awful. And he noticed there was a carafe of clear liquid sitting on the kitchen table. And he asked if he could do that. And the farmer says, go right ahead. Well, he had drunk about half of this carafe before he realizes it is not water. It's Calvados brandy. And if anyone's ever had that before, you'll understand that every epitomal cell in his throat was probably destroyed at that point in time. He couldn't talk for three days. And so... Before we go to the video, uh, I'd like to just reiterate some statistical things about the European war. Some people argue these numbers are different in, according to different authorities, but I, I think that they're accurate enough to give us a, a good idea of what was going on in Europe in World War II. Over 30,000 airmen were killed in World War II. 30,000. We lost over 39,000 aircraft of all types to all causes in Europe alone. We're not talking Pacific, Japan, or any of this. This is strictly Europe. We had over 14,000 wounded in the aircraft that made it back home. We had 33,000 POWs. 33,000. And out of all those numbers, only 2,500 
were successful evaders. So that tells you something about the difficulty of being an airman on the ground in occupied Europe. With that, I'm going to turn it on to the video. As I said, the video was created uh, by uh, Gert van den Bogart, who is a uh, Belgian. The associate producer was Sean Claxton. The director of photography was Jed Henry from Wisconsin. I acted as the research and historian uh, for the group. And uh, the, the entire enterprise was financed by donations and the United States Air Force. The United States Air Force paid $30,000 to make this happen. And to make sure it happened, they sent two of their own from Vandenberg Air Force Base to participate in this video. The video starts with the aircraft on the ground and the evaders trying to figure out what to do. And it follows the evasion footsteps of Bud Owens as he attempts to find freedom in Spain. dans les oreilles le bruit des, des bombardiers. Hein. Pendant la guerre, ils se, quand il y avait des combats, ou même quand ils passaient, ils passaient en, en groupe, et il y avait ce bruit sourd qu'on entendait des, des bombardiers qui traversaient le ciel. Hein. Et ça, ça m'est toujours resté. Hein. In mid-1943, the Allies launched Operation Point Blank, The primary aim of this combined bomber offensive was to cripple or destroy the German fighter aircraft strength to ensure it would not be an obstacle for the upcoming invasion of Northwestern Europe on D-Day. World War II and the air offensive over Europe ended more than 70 years ago. Several generations have followed since, leaving its legacy in a more distant past. A past in which all that is left are a few old pictures, a medal or two, and some faded memories from those few who still remain today. Oh, okay. Such is the case for the story of Francis Bud Owens, an airman in the U.S. Army Air Force's mighty 8th Air Force, one of the millions of young Americans who served during World War II. For the Owens family, as for many families today who had someone in uniform during the war, the details of his service often remain quite vague. Bud's youngest brother, Jim, has few recollections of him. There's a considerable age difference between he and I, probably eight years. He older than I'm the last of 10 of us. So I really didn't get a, a lot of chance and a lot of opportunities to, uh, to get to know him. Bud Owen's 20-year-old great-niece, Haley Holbert, knows even less about her uncle. But like everyone in her family, she shares a deep sense of pride about his service. I'm extremely proud of him for doing everything that he did. I know he wouldn't probably think of himself as a hero, but to me, he is a hero. Haley understands it is her generation's responsibility to keep Bud's story alive in the family. But it wasn't until she was contacted by a stranger in Normandy that she was actually given an opportunity to follow her great uncle's footsteps in Europe. My name is Gert van den Bogart, and I am a Normandy battlefield guide. When Gert contacted the Owens family, their response was immediate. As soon as the, the project information was made available to my family, it was like immediately, yes, I'll go. I felt that perhaps as his niece, um, I could be a link between some of the older people in my family and some of the younger. 20-year-old Staff Sergeant Francis Bud Owens served as a waste gunner on board a B-17 Flying Fortress of the U.S. 8th Air Force's 381st Bomber Group. He was one of 10 crew members that included co-pilot Lieutenant John Kara. My name is Warren Kara, and my father was a pilot with the 381st Bomb Group. Francis Owens was actually unknown to my father and his own crew. Francis was a last-minute substitution aboard my father's uh, B-17, which was slated to bomb a uh, Focke-Wulf engine factory in Le Mans, France, 
on July 4th, 1943. Uh, due to the circumstances of planes uh, going down, crew members being injured, uh, at the last minute for this bomb mission, uh, Francis Owen and two other gunners were assigned to the crew. There it is, the flare out of the lead ship, the signal for the bomb run. The plane on its bomb run had a near miss from an anti-aircraft round. That round exploded right underneath the radio man's uh, compartment in the aircraft. That uh, explosion severed all the oxygen lines to the rear of the aircraft. The pilot of the aircraft, uh, Olaf Ballinger and my father, uh, made a decision to go down to lower elevation so the crew would be able to breathe again in the back. Going down to 10,000 feet probably uh, doomed the aircraft. In fact, it did doom the aircraft because the uh, Messerschmitt pilots immediately saw this lone plane and they started just plinking at it. And they would stand off at some distance from the plane, just fire guns into it, circle around. It was a big game to them. And this plane was slowly chopped to pieces over about 75 miles to the point where there was virtually nothing left. It was actually very chaotic on that airplane. Uh, my father was telling me that, uh, uh, in fact, a number of the people are hysterical. They just were going crazy over the whole thing. Olaf Ballinger gave his crew the order to bail out, but during the chaos, no one had realized that Sergeant John Lane, the radio operator, had been severely wounded. Nobody except Bud Owens. Francis then ran back up to the front of the airplane, opened up the radio man's compartment, and found him lying on the floor uh, with some terrible rents in his side where this uh, flak burst had literally just split him wide open. He was still alive, but bleeding profusely and uh, was not really conscious. He just could barely move. Without really thinking much about it, Francis evidently grabbed the guy took him to the back of the airplane, Francis took his own parachute off, clipped it to the radio operator, threw him out the door and pulled the D-ring on his parachute release as he went out. Owens then uh, went to uh, the waste gun position where they kept a spare parachute, clipped that on, and eventually got out of the plane. Bud Owens' bravery in combat revealed a strong sense of duty and a true dedication to his fellow airmen, a dedication he had already demonstrated several weeks before his dramatic third mission over occupied France when a terrible accident occurred at his station in England on June 23, 1943. They were loading up bombs in uh, an aircraft adjacent to my father's. Something happened. They evidently dropped one of the bombs and a massive set of explosions started occurring. Francis Owens was actually in my father's plane cleaning his guns at the time when he watched the plane next to him just disappear in a puff of smoke and shrapnel and terrible things were happening. Francis ran from the plane and as he was leaving, he noticed that one of the armorers that was involved in the initial explosion was laying underneath the wing of the plane with a compound fracture to his leg and bleeding profusely. While this is going on, Francis picked him up and literally took him to safety uh, amidst all these explosions. He was awarded the Soldier's Medal for that, which was the uh, decoration primarily for valor outside of a combat uh, setting. Through his courageous actions, Bud Owens represents an inspiring example for those who currently serve. Captain Luke Oman and Staff Sergeant Troy Cahoon both serve in Bud's 381st group today. Accompanied by Sam Soderberg, a young member of the Air National Guard, they too will be traveling with the Owens family to France to follow in Bud's footsteps. I think it's really important for us to do this journey. In my own personal opinion, I really feel like a lot of us are out of touch with what freedom means and what it takes to have the freedom that a lot of us take for granted. Waiting for them in France, is 19-year-old Louis Hatte, whose family lived in occupied Normandy during World War II. On dit que la connaissance c'est la, la vraie richesse de l'homme, et je pense que c'est vrai, mais surtout, voilà, savoir ce que notre notre, notre ancêtre a fait, c'est incroyable. Et au-delà au de ça, on a aussi l'aventure humaine qu'on partage ensemble. Together with Haley and her aunt Colleen, 
they will start their journey at the crash site of Owen's B-17 in Normandy. I don't know how I'm going to feel about it. I think part of it is going to feel sad because three people died in the crash. You know, not everybody made it out. I think if there's any evidence left of where that plane went down, that's probably going to be the hardest thing is seeing that, like, destruction, you know? So it's just going to be emotional. A little bit overwhelming. Vous allez bien? Plaisir de vous revoir. Plaisir de vous revoir. Le groupe est finalement arrivé. Je vous présente Madame Brennan, Mademoiselle Albert, qui nous vient des États-Unis, la famille de, de Bud Owens. <rire> voilà. Heli, donc la petite nièce. Et puis on a Louis aussi, les jeunes. On a Sam qui est là, Louis, l'arrière-petit-fils d'André Rougeron. Bonjour. Luke et Troy. Voilà. Et puis notre guide Vanessa qui est là, là aujourd'hui aussi. Bon, vous, vous allez nous amener euh, voir ce champ alors. Ok. Super, merci. super. C'est loin okay. Allons-y. Bien. Bon. Donc c'est par ici. On va par là-bas. Oui. Allons-y. So we're going to go see the field. Yeah. We'll just follow Mr. Show, Sean. Je un coup de main. Ça va aller. Hop. D'accord. A lot of this is for my pap, so I'm kind of thinking, you know, what can I take back for him? What stories can I take back for him? So I'd kind of like to hear if um, Monsieur Chauchon was around during the crash, what, how his parents reacted to it, to them being in the town, how that whole situation went down. Um, and it's awesome to see. Oh, it's a tremendous honor being here with their family members. Um, I, I couldn't imagine doing this on my own. I wouldn't know where to go or how to start. And, and it's, it's a tremendous honor to be with them and, and to be able to follow the footsteps of their family member, Bud Owens. There's the cows. <laughs> For me, it's a way to make a connection with the past. And being a military member, it's kind of neat to be able to make connection with my past military relatives that have fought and actually see some of the areas that they've gone through. OK. On essaie de passer en dessous. D'accord, très bien. Hop, on y va. Allez, venez. Merci. D'accord. D'accord. Donc du coup, à votre gauche, il y avait l'avion qui s'est tombé de oui, ce voilà, côté-là, oui, oui, dans le champ, là. Oui. Et puis à droite, il y avait des morceaux là, un petit peu partout. D'accord. D'accord. Euh, ah oui, partout. Mr. Shoshan was just explaining that the plane crashed in this field here, in this general vicinity, when he was a a kid growing up, you know, his dad would take him out to the field and he said there were pieces of metal lying all over the place and you know, he found some here in the hedgerow and he said that the farmer who owned the field, you know, he, you know, he used the field and every day there were pieces of metal that he had to move over to the side, you know, because there was always something that would sort of, you know, pop up at, at some point, uh, pieces there. Being on the field where the, where the plane, its final resting space, uh, I don't know if I know how to describe it. It, 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 you feel like you're part of maybe what those gentlemen went through. It gives me a sense of almost being on sacred ground. Few witnesses of the crash remain today. Claudine and Yvette Duval lived near the site and were only six and seven years old on that fateful 4th of July, 1943. On avait l'habitude de voir passer des avions, mais des combats aériens, on n'en avait jamais vu. De voir les avions de chasse piquer sur un avion qui était commencé à flamber un peu, et, et voir des pilotes, ça faisait des petites tasses blanches qui sortaient de l'avion, on n'avait jamais vu. Alors, j'avais 6 ans. 
euh, mais euh, ça fait plus de 70 ans et, et je m'en enfin, souviens. Pour moi, c'était une journée effrayante. Hein. J'ai eu très peur et puis aussi quand, quand l'avion est passé au-dessus de la maison parce qu'il était en flamme et il tombait des morceaux, des morceaux d'avion, des morceaux d'aluminium, des morceaux de je ne sais quoi. Alors, et ça faisait une poussière dans la maison, une poussière effrayante parce que le bruit les secousse sans doute. Alors, entre le plafond et, euh, et le mur, il y avait un centimètre. Hein. Le, ça, avait, ça avait fait bouger les murs. Hein. Bonjour, bonjour. Vous allez bien Ça va. Moi, bon, je suis heureux de vous revoir. Bonjour. Bonjour. This is uh, Yvette. Uh, Yvette Duval, because that was her maiden name. Louis, Haley, qui est la petite nièce du, de l'aviateur. Oui, okay. So this is the house where um, the Duval family lived in 1943. People in the nearby town of La Coulange heard the crash, including Mr. Duval, Claudine and Yvette's father, who had left for work earlier that morning. Quand ils ont su que l'avion était tombé au Val de V, il a téléphoné, on était toutes les deux à la maison et on avait tellement peur qu'on n'a pas répondu. Alors il a cru que, que l'avion était tombé sur la maison. Alors il est arrivé, il a trouvé un vélo, il est arrivé euh, presque aussitôt, hein, il est descendu. Il se trouvait parce so, que la boulangerie était au fond. So just have a look at this picture here. This is the picture of her dad in front of the house. I, I think that hit me the hardest, knowing that we were actually talking and I shook her hand and I was there speaking with the lady that actually watched the plane crash. Bienvenue à toutes et à tous à la cérémonie du 72e anniversaire du crash du bombardier américain le 4 juillet 1943. Cette cérémonie se déroulera en trois temps. Le discours de Monsieur le maire, le dépôt de gerbe et les hymnes. Following the ceremony, Emmanuel Doucet, a local resident, wanted to show a poignant relic from the past to the group. Uh, donc c'est une pièce historique. Uh, on voit différents impacts de d'obus allemands uh, quand la, la forteresse a été abattue. So this is an oxygen tank from Bud's plane. Basically, what he's saying is that this item and several other items he has of the plane, he uses them in you know, exhibits that he sets up and, you know, to try and, you know, keep people you know, reminded of what happened and preserve the memory. This is probably the closest or the most powerful, tangible reminder that we have of what happened that 4th of July, 1943. Leaving La Coulange, the group picked up Bud's trail again at Val de Vey. So the farm behind me is the farm that belonged to Mr. Balash uh, in 1943. He was a farmer, and we believe that Bud Owens landed not that far from his farm uh, in his parachute. As soon as they hit the ground, uh, they uh, went into hiding, tore off their insignia, and uh, basically they had little maps with them to tell them you know, which way was south, which way was north, and uh, 
the, uh, the instruction at that stage of the war was is try to get yourself to neutral Spain, if you could. To avoid capture by the enemy, Bud Owens relied on the help of locals like Charles Balash, who led him to a cabbage patch near the home of Yvette and Claudine Duvall, where Olaf Ballinger was already hiding. Later in the day, the teacher of La Coulanche and his brother-in-law, who spoke some English, picked up both Owens and Ballinger in order to hide them for the night in the attic of an old mill. So the trail that you see here run behind me is the trail that we believe that Olaf Ballinger and Bud Owens went down on, accompanied by Mr. Verger, the teacher, and uh, Mr. Milikanda from La Coulange, to take them to the mill um, where they would spend their first night in France. You see, it's a narrow lane. It leads to a small valley. It's a bit secluded from the rest of the town. And you can sort of imagine why they would want to bring the two aviators here. See that? See that right there? Oh, that's the mill. That's what's left of it, yep. Maybe we'll get a better view over from, from here. It's all in ruins now, but you see one of the walls still standing there. That's where, um, that's where Mr. Verger, the school teacher, took Bud and all have to spend their first night. After three nights hiding in the attic of the mill, both Owens and Ballinger were taken to the village of St. Opportune. Here, they would rely on the help of a local farmer named André Jalon. Alors, mon papa est rentré dans la résistance. Je pense euh, savoir que il était en relation étroite avec l'instituteur du village, qui était Monsieur Mazeline, qui était déjà lui euh, euh, plongé dans dans la résistance. Pour Janine Jalon Gandabov. The two airmen stay at her family's farm more than 70 years ago left a lasting impression. Là on peut voir Owens, le plus grand naturellement puisque les Américains à cette époque encore maintenant bien sûr étaient de grande taille. Monsieur Mazeline, euh, Balinger, un autre Américain, maman, mon papa et la petite fille que j'étais à l'époque. Leur vie euh, en tant que jeunes gens, ça devait être très pénible d'être euh, caché, de vivre caché. D'abord, il fallait les vêtir. C'était des jeunes gens de grande taille. Euh, en Normandie, euh, à l'époque, euh, les Fran le français était des pantalons, ils arrivaient mi-jambe, en fait, etc. Il fallait déjà euh, s'occuper de tout cela. Uh, Francis Owens was almost 6'4". He stood out like a sore thumb. The average Frenchman was barely 5'8". And so just hiding a man of that dimension was, was tough. So there was a lot of interesting problems that the French people had to deal with. Just finding clothes for these people. That, you know, it, it's no problem for you today to go to some place and find extra, extra large. Well, they didn't have that. Ils séjournaient donc dans la, ils habitaient dans la grange, il fallait toujours qu'ils se camouflent. Ils avaient tendance en tant que jeunes gens, jeunes, dynamiques et peut-être même un petit peu euh, goût du risque de montrer le bout du nez. Euh, papa, par contre, ça, je me souviens très bien que papa disait, allez, dit, 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 euh, hein. Oh, la trudière. No, you, you can park. Yep. Thank you, man. Bonjour. Vous allez bien? <laughs> ça va très bien. Ça s'est bien passé. Ça va très bien. Oui, oui, oui. <laughs> Bonjour Monsieur Gambeuf, vous allez bien Je vous présente l'invité américain Colin Brennan, Bonjour. qui est la, la nièce, la nièce. <rire> voilà. Voilà. Super. On va se rendre à la grange. D'accord. Euh, L'hôtel aux quatre étoiles. Wow. Voilà. Wow, voilà la fameuse grange. Voilà la grange wow. où ils habitaient. So there would have been hay here when Bud was here, um, and actually the door was right over there. You see, they say so they closed that part and they put a new door in here. But that's sort of you know where he would come in and go out whenever he had an opportunity. Were there animals in here with them? Let's ask. 
Il n'y avait pas d'animaux dans la grange Non. 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 Donc ils vivaient quand même non. juste euh, seuls avec... Ah, oui, euh... la, euh, la paille. So the only thing they had here was rabbits and cider. Did, <laughs> um, did the Germans ever come to inspect? Not when no. he was here. No. No, not when he was here. But they did come here afterwards. Very, very much danger. Yes. For your family. Il y avait du danger pour votre, votre famille, donc, ah, du coup. Oui, 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 mais bon, oh, euh, c'était des vrais patriotes à l'époque. Hein. C'était vraiment des gens qui, le danger, je crois, que faisait abstraction. Hein. Their parents, back in the day, they were true je patriots. Pense, ouais, on, on, je pense qu'on ne peut pas s'imaginer mm -hmm. l'état d'esprit des gens de l'époque. Je crois que ça, ça nous... It's hard to imagine the way people thought about all this and how they felt, how strongly they felt about things back then. You know, being a true patriot was, you know, you just didn't think about the danger that was involved. So I just you're saying you really can't understand it today. Bien sûr qu'on est fier, euh, on est fier euh, d'avoir eu des parents qui ont eu ce, qui sont des héros finalement euh, à leur façon et de sauver ces, ces jeunes gens là. Oui, bien sûr qu'on est fier. Bon, parce que ils, ils, ils en parlaient toujours, toujours ça revenait. Périodiquement, ça je me souviens, et il avait toujours beaucoup de chagrin. Excusez-moi. After about two months at the Jelon farm, everything was finally in place to move the airmen further down the underground escape pipeline. They were now entrusted to Andre Rougeron, an auto engineer and former experimental race car driver who had already successfully helped two other members of Owen's crew evade. For Rougeron's great grandson, Louis Hatte, this is a chance to connect with his family's past. Nowadays, we are at school, we, we, learn, we learn English, but so I think it's easier to me to speak in English than my great-grandfather, so it's not easy to me to speak in English, so I imagine for my great-grandfather it was very hard to, um, to communicate with bird. On August 28, 1943, Andre Rougeron came to pick up Owens and Ballinger in his Renault Prima Quatre. In a fitting way, Louis and Haley head to the town of Sean Sucre in a vintage vehicle similar to Rougeron's. Have you ever been in anything this old? What? Have you ever been in a car this old? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, no. I... Hiding in that barn would have been tough. Hiding in the barn. The barn? Barn. Okay. The barn. Okay. Um, that place where um, we went on their farm. grandfather uh, is coming to look for a bird to, to to come in in the in the in the train. I think bird was uh, was happy to to, to leave. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so. but imagine bird um, when uh, during the, the war he, he can't he can't he can't be like this. Yeah. He can't he can't be. Uh, by, uh, by the glass. Uh... He'd have to be ducked. In Sean Sucre, Owens and Ballinger stayed at the post office where they would await their transfer to Paris by train. For Louis and Haley, this was a chance to see where Bud stayed during the next four days. Je vous présente Mme Paulin, qui est responsable de, de la poste ici. D'accord, bonjour. Louis. Bonjour. Louis. Ah, il y a un petit-fils d'André Bougeron. Enchanté. Enchanté. Et Haley, qui est la bonjour. 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 nièce Enchanté. de, de Bud Owens. On va jeter un coup d'œil à l'intérieur Tout à fait. Allons-y.
aussi la chambre d'hôte. D'accord. D'accord. So this is one of the rooms, possibly the one that Bud slept in uh, for the last few days before he, uh, he left. So this is the view he had. Well, apparently he slept for 15 hours straight. I so, would too. Yeah. <laughs> Better than the, the barn over 36 there. 36 days in the barn, or 46 right, days in the right. barn. Absolutely, yeah. A real bed, some good food, and on his way to Paris in a few days. So, probably the, one of the better parts of his journey, I guess. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Owens and Ballinger were left in the care of postal employee Mademoiselle Vautier and Andre Rougeron's close friends, the Bourguins. They also went out of their way to spoil the airmen as much as they could before they left Normandy. Okay, just uh, want everybody's attention just for a, a moment. Um, I think we had a pretty special day here in Jean Sacre, seeing the post office, seeing with Bud, um, spend some time there. And uh, one of the things that really um, was special for him were all the meals he had, like the great meal we had here tonight. Some of the last really good meals that he probably had were here in Jean Sacre. And with those great meals, there was always champagne. So I think one of the things we can do to pay tribute to Bud and Olaf Ballinger is to make a toast and uh, try some of this champagne. And so we'll start working the bottle. Squeeze around. Sweaty hand. Oh, there goes one. There goes one. Oh, my goodness. Can I get it off? I got my sweaty hands. Whoa. There you go. All right. So we'll have some champagne for a, for a toast. And um, probably the last time they had good food like that was in Pennsylvania and Ohio. And we're having it here in France and there are... Uh, <laughs> 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 All right. All right, guys. Here's the Bud Owens, Ola Ballinger, Andre Rougeron, and all the evaded airmen and resistance who helped them. Santé. The guys that made it and the guys that didn't. So this morning we have uh, about a five mile hike from the town of Jean Sucre, where Bud Owens spent his last night in Normandy, to um, the train station at saint bomer la forge where André Rougeron and uh, Mr. Bourgoin took him uh, to get him to Paris, which was the next um, stage of his uh, journey. It's a different landscape. We were on like small farms and stuff, and then you get into these big farms and then out into the woods and just to think that this train ran through there, it's pretty, pretty cool. When we were walking, we passed, the trees grow really close together, so we passed a bunch of like walls of trees and people, they would have had to hide in there if like a car or a bicycle or somebody was coming by, you know, because they didn't want to be seen. For Louis, this stage of the journey is a real eye-opener to what his great-grandfather accomplished. Bah, j'imagine même pas la, la peur qui la peur qu'ils ont pu avoir parce que je pense qu'elle est inimaginable quand on la vit pas ils ont il y a avoir une montée d'adrénaline ça doit être quelque chose de tellement fort justement marcher dans ses pas c'est c'est plus qu'une fierté par rapport à, à l'homme qu'il a été à ce qu'il a accompli c'est euh, c'est rien ce qu'on fait à côté de de ce que lui a fait like Bud Owens and Olaf Ballinger on September 1st 1943 the group board their own train. Train travel was the norm of travel in those days. There was very little in the way of vehicle activity because there was no gasoline or anything to run the cars. So everybody was on the train. Uh, if you minded your own business, uh, typically uh, you weren't molested on the trains. Uh, the Germans sometimes asked for papers, but the underground provided those to both Ballinger and Owens. They had phony identification.
in spite of a strong german presence paris formed a vital hub for many escape and evasion networks due to its central location and numerous rail connections to all points in france at age sixteen michel agnel was a member of the burgundy network which was actively trying to move allied airmen through the city of lights Bonjour Madame Agnès, plaisir de vous je rencontrer. Suis ravie de vous voir. Oui, je vous je vous présente euh, les membres de notre groupe Madame Brennan qui est la nièce de de Bud Owens, <rire> la vieille. <rire> vous avez Heli, la petite nièce, et Louis, l'arrière petit fils. Donc les aviateurs étaient soit on allait les chercher, soit on nous les amenait dans les gares, et ensuite on les dispatchait dans différents chez différents helpers, chez différents logeurs, où il restait le temps d'être correct pour partir en, dans le sud. Owens and Ballinger were taken in by the Burgundy network and moved around the city, spending most of their time in a small safe house in a northern suburb of the French capital. There was nothing for them to do. Uh, they, none of them spoke or read French, so they couldn't even read books. Uh, <clears throat> all they could do is play cards and cooped up in this little place. At any one time in Paris, there was probably hundreds of evaders hiding out in people's lofts, in people's basements, in closets, and uh, everybody was trying to move these people south to get to the, uh, the Spanish frontier. But the organization and the machinery wasn't in place to get that done. And so that's why they had long, long waits of inactivity. The airmen were trapped inside for a good reason. The risk of revealing their true identity was ever present. Ils avaient une dégaine, la dégaine américaine, un peu nonchalante, les mains dans les poches, en trifouillant toujours euh, leur monnaie. Et il fallait leur dire qu'il fallait se promener avec les mains dehors, etc. Et d'autre part, eh bien, il fallait leur apprendre à fumer comme les Français. Parce que les Français fumaient d'une manière, je crois que c'est en mettant les, les doigts comme ça, ou le contraire, et les Américains comme ça. Je ne sais plus lequel des deux, mais il fallait absolument. C'est mon père en particulier qui avait repéré qu'il ne fumait pas comme lui. Donc on leur a appris à fumer, mais c'était très difficile car les habitudes sont prises. Teaching the airmen how to smoke was a challenge, but finding enough food for them was almost impossible. One of the big issues was is that France was starving to death. Uh, Germany was diverting all of the, uh, not only manufacturing assets, but all the food that was produced in France to Germany. So the French people were not uh, you know, really basking in a lot of calories. They were starving to death. And here these big strapping Americans come and they have appetites like no one's ever seen before. And uh, so that was quite dismaying to a lot of French families. They wanted to help, but they, uh, they typically were watching a week's worth of groceries go down the throat of a guy in one meal. After six weeks, which felt like an eternity, the airmen were taken to an apartment in downtown Paris. Boredom and food shortages had been their main concerns, but with every passing day, the risk of being discovered became even greater. Regrettably, within the, the French underground, there was a number of traitors. And so everyone was paranoid, and in this particular case, paranoia was absolutely acceptable behavior, because if you weren't paranoid, you weren't alive. Following a Gestapo raid on their apartment, Owens and Ballinger made a close escape, finding refuge in a nearby bistro, today a Chinese restaurant. Simone Molin, a waitress at their new temporary hideout, then took the airmen to her home and supplied them with much of what they would need to make a swift and permanent escape out of Paris. Finally, after nearly two months in the French capital, Bud Owens and six other U.S. airmen were assembled at the Jardin de Plantes Botanical Garden near Paris's Gare d'Austerlitz train station. From there, they would start their journey south, over 10 hours on board a night train across occupied France to the town of St. Jerome. Located at the foot of the Pyrenees Mountains, St. Jerome was the departure point for many evaders and escapees who attempted the dangerous crossing to Andorra and Spain. The Hotel Echen is the only hotel in saint Jerome that housed evaders and is still in operation today. After an overnight stay here, the group begins its long hike across the mountains in the footsteps of Bud Owens.
We're in saint Jean, France. Um, we are going to be hiking, today at least, 16 miles through the Pyrenees Mountains, and it's supposed to be extremely hot. So, like 102 degrees hot. <laughs> the heat's definitely a factor, and it's going to be hard, but I said I was going to do this for me, and I said I was going to do this for my grandpa and my uncle, and I'm going to do it, you know? I'm channeling Bud. J'aimerais vraiment réaliser ce que eux ont fait euh, à leur époque, mais euh, ouais, j'appréhende vraiment de savoir le chemin qu'ils ont parcouru. Et encore, nous, on n'est pas aussi stressés, euh, pas l'adrénaline qu'eux avaient. Mais euh, ouais, j'appréhende de ne pas réussir ce que eux ont réussi. To help them across the mountains, the group meets up with Paul Williams, a professional mountain guide. Paul, great Hello. to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you much for being here. The rest of the group. Hello. All... Nice to meet you. This is Paul. Paul will be our guide. Paul, so where are we now? We're actually during the Second World War. This is where the tarmac would have ended. The evades would have been driven here, picked up their guides, and then they would have carried on on a on a mule track. Okay. And from this um, this point on, it would only get harder, then, right? Only get harder. Okay. Yeah. That's why we've got you. Okay. Let's, Thank let's you. give it a try. Let's go. All right. Okay. So Paul, this is a this is a memorial to the the uh, the passer or the the guides. It also mentions um, other patriots and shepherds. Would they have had a role here? Yes, each uh, each passer or guide would have had their own group of friends who lived along the trail who would look out for German patrols and they would be able to let the passer know if there was a German patrol in the area by making a very smoky fire to have black smoke coming out of a chimney or leaving certain items on a washing line and from those signals the passer would know if it was, if it was a green light to go or a red light to, to turn back. After a long and hot day of hiking, the group arrives at the village of Souk and settles in at the local mountain center. It was here in Souk that Owens and the other evaders were left in the care of a rugged mountaineer named Emil Delpy. That evening, Delpy's family and friends surprised the group with a visit. J'ai grandi à ses côtés. J'ai grandi aux côtés de mes grands-parents. J'ai grandi ici. Mes parents étaient occupés euh, à faire leurs études. Et j'ai été euh, de tout temps, même s'il restait discret, baigné par euh, cette ambiance. 
Mais j'ai connu Émile Delpy comme un jeune instituteur ici dans cette école et c'était mon plus proche voisin et c'est devenu mon ami parce que on avait des, des affinités communes, notamment la chasse, on chassait ensemble et il était truculent, c'est-à-dire il aimait rire, il aimait raconter des histoires, il aimait boire à l'apéritif et j'y suis allé souvent le boire avec lui et nous étions très amis aussi pour cela et, et surtout il aimait la vie. Euh, C'est un patriote. Je crois que c'est un patriote, ou du moins les gens qui sont des patriotes expriment leur patriotisme de différentes manières. Lui, il n'avait pas beaucoup de moyens de l'exprimer. Celui-là en était un. Il connaissait la montagne. Il pouvait aider des gens. Il pouvait faire quelque chose. Oui, oui c'était, c'était euh, comme beaucoup de montagnards, un résistant dans l'âme, un résistant né. Emil Delpy knew the mountains like the back of his hand. But every crossing had its own set of problems, which required his resourcefulness. And he's basically saying there were lots of options for his, a, a col here, a col there, Arinsal here, Portorata. And he's saying he's not quite sure why he changed. He just liked to mix things up. There's the, there's yeah. the barn, Paul. Yeah. Before heading off for the second day of hiking, barn up there, guys. The group discovers where Bud Owens and the other evaders spent their last night in France. Paul, so we're here at the, uh, uh, in Souk at the start of our second day of hiking, and we just spent the night in the town at the mountain center there, but uh, that's not where Emile Delpy took Bud Owens and the other evaders to spend the night. Um, they were in this barn, weren't they? Yes, yes. Yes, this is the actual barn where Emile would have taken the, the escape party. And this barn is part of the sort of mountain farm where Emile grew up. The, the sort of main farmhouse is, is, is lower down the slope and we're sort of hidden away in the forest. And that was the idea. Mountain patrols were in the area and Emile didn't want to get caught by those, so he's taken the party, hidden them away in the forest. There are various routes out from the actual building so that if a patrol by chance came across them, they had various ways to escape. Uh, so he was not only the perfect helper, he, had, he lived in the perfect place to take the evaders to. Exactly, exactly. Hidden away. Okay. Excellent. So it's a perfect place to start the second day. Okay, hey Paul, we're nearing the end of our second day of the hike here, and uh, uh, in 1943, Emil Delpy was hoping to find a place for Bud Owens and the rest of the party to, to stay overnight, um, but it didn't really work out that way, did it? No. They got here at the end of the second day to find another group already here. Um, no room for both groups, so Emil decided to, to take his group on further, just carry on without stopping. So already tired, badly fed, very little food, they carried on. So from this point on, no more sleep for them. Exactly right. Wow. And they still have quite a bit to go, right? Yeah. The hardest part. The hardest part. Right. The hardest part to come. Okay. Well, we only have a few miles and I think we're ready for some sleep after that probably. So let's keep Time going go. then. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Compte tenu des conditions dans lesquelles il avait récupéré le groupe, qui visiblement, d'après ce qu'il m'avait raconté, était talonné par euh, la police française ou, euh, ou allemande qui était à sa recherche, il ne pouvait pas différer le passage. Il fallait absolument leur faire franchir la frontière le plus rapidement possible. Le risque était énorme de se faire reprendre et qu'ils se fassent prendre tous ensemble. 
il a dû tenter le passage avec un groupe, ce qu'il nous avait raconté, un groupe qui était déjà fatigué, déjà dans des conditions, comme souvent, des gens qui franchissaient les Pyrénées avec lui, dans des conditions toujours délicates, avec des gens peu habitués à la montagne. The hike today was definitely more difficult than yesterday was. Um, yesterday, I felt as bad as I would have after a 90-minute soccer game. And today, towards the end, I was struggling so much that I had to kick it into high gear up a couple of hills. So I can understand a little bit more what he was going through. After this second day, I feel happy to have passed these two steps. Mais, euh, mais fatigué, euh, parce que le, le parcours a quand même été long, même s'il n'est pas fini, il a été long. Euh, non, je me, je me sens bien. On a une bonne équipe qui, qui a réussi à nous emmener ici. Je pense que c'est grâce à eux si quand même j'ai réussi à, à franchir ces deux étapes. Yeah, Louis m'a dit que j'avais eu un temps difficile. And we had to keep the group together and, and go back and talk with Louis, try to keep his spirits high. And he mentioned to me here at the very end of the whole day, uh, day's worth of hike, let me know that he couldn't have done it without me. And, and that really touched me, that meant a lot. Est-ce que je pourrais imaginer repartir comme ça, sans, sans manger, sans dormir? Honnêtement, je pense pas. Euh, je pense que pour faire ça, il faut vraiment être très fort mentalement. Et voilà. Bonsoir, bonsoir, nous y sommes. Qu'est-ce que vous pensez de je pense que déjà j'ai été, euh, pas été à, enfin, à quasiment à mes limites. Euh, je, non, j'aurais vraiment besoin de dormir et, et de manger pour reprendre des forces, sinon je pense que je m'écroulerais. C'est un peu freezing outside. Et je ne like, pas. Je suis shaking, donc so je ne peux pas imaginer being nearly hypothermic, like they were, you know? Last night, I remember, I kept dreaming that I was gonna slide down a hill and fall off a cliff, you know, like, today for me is a little scary. Uh, day three of the hike, um, pretty successful first two days. Everybody was um, pretty much into the hike, a little bit tired. Let's go, I just wanna go. I want to do it for him. I want to be able to finish this for him. You know, take him home. What we're looking at now is the actual border. This frontier ridge is the border with Andorra. And to the right, you've got um, passes that go into Spain. Our passing place on the, on the frontier is just round to the left. Thousand meters of ascent to get us into Andorra. Let's go. With temperatures of over 100 degrees and no shade, the climb becomes a challenge for the group. But when Bud Owens attempted his crossing in October of 1943, contrasting conditions were even worse. A heavy snowstorm made it a truly life-threatening endeavor. Well, going up the, uh, up the mountain from Souk was an extraordinarily difficult climb. The terrain is extremely steep. And put yourself in their shoes of being basically very poorly nourished. Most of them had a third and fourth hand-me-down clothes. There was uh, very poor footgear available. Most shoes in France during World War II were made out of cardboard because there was no leather available. Soon, things became worse for the evaders. In the party was a uh, person named Harold Bailey, a lieutenant. Uh, he was a navigator. Bailey, uh, in order to keep up his strength, had uh, taken, uh, taken what it was called dexedrine or benzedrine uh, stimulants. So a lot of pilots and air crew used these to keep their energy up uh, in, the, in the light of lack of food because most of them weren't very well nourished at all. Uh, Bailey took too many benzodrines, and as a consequence, he started losing consciousness. As Lieutenant Bailey collapsed in the snow, Owens once again came to the rescue of a fellow airman. He couldn't walk, and uh, a, uh, so Owens and Sergeant Plaskett uh, uh, were doing what they could to help him uh, survive this uh, climb up the mountains. It was about 40 miles straight up uh, this sharp incline from 
southern France up to the Pyrenees Mountains to Andorra, where they eventually would go back down again into Spain for, to escape. Owens and Sergeant Plaskett dragged Lieutenant Bailey uh, for about 40 miles. Well done, everyone. So you're at nearly 2,800 meters, and I'm standing in Andorra, and you're standing still in France, and the border runs along this ridge. And Andorra represented the gateway to freedom for the evadees and the escapees. So to get here, then into neutral Andorra, that, that, was, that was their big goal. Although he had finally managed to escape from occupied France, Bud Owens and two of his fellow airmen were by now totally exhausted as they started their descent into Andorra and collapsed in the snow, unable to move any further. Owens was the only member of those three that was actually conscious. He couldn't move, his legs wouldn't do what he wanted them to do, but he was conscious. And the last thing out of his mouth uh, to the remainder of the group was, give a guy a chance, just give me a chance, I'll get up, I'll get up, but he couldn't. Emil Delpy tried in vain to get the airman to move, even firing his pistol in the snow near Bud Owen's head, but to no avail. Concernant cette, ce drame, je crois que à chaque fois qu'il en parlait, il le revivait. Ça l'affectait terriblement, mais alors très fort. Vous savez, c'était un homme dur, c'est comme rude, comme ces montagnards. Mais quand il racontait cet, cet épisode, c'était le seul où il avait eu cet échec. Il appelait ça mon échec. Et, et je l'ai vu, les larmes aux yeux, souvent, parce qu'il aimait le raconter un peu comme pour, pour l'expulser de lui-même, pour, pour effacer ce terrible souvenir et, et, et ces trois morts qu'il qu regrettait amèrement et, et pour lesquels il n'avait rien pu faire. Looking at it in the cold light of day, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a difficult thing to accept somebody who had that much uh, empathy for his fellow man to help them. Uh, suddenly, is gone, and is gone simply because no one could help him. When he had spent most of his time helping others, it was a, uh, it's supreme irony from my point of view, and uh, uh, it's a very emotional event. He was born December 26th, so he, he would have been 21 in a couple of months from the time he perished. He spent that 19 or 20 of those years with my parents, maybe nine or ten months with the military and uh, those character traits I don't think the army developed in nine months I think My parents and our family uh, contributed to that development, I believe, over the his first 20 years. And we're going to move down now to the site where the bodies were recovered. It's very humbling to be here to, to know that American airmen have lost their lives right here for the sake of our country and for, for our freedoms. And it's just not only been physically exhausting, but like now that I'm here, it's been emotionally exhausting. You know, you're tired and you don't want to keep going, but you do because it's something that's important to you. Oui, c'est sûr, c'est sûr que cette histoire nous a réunis. Il nous a réunis à, à travers cette aventure. It's just hard to think about. Like, he made it this far, and 
something happened that he couldn't make it the rest of the way. And like, after getting to know him, he was such a great person. And the fact that I never got to meet him makes me sad. Part of why I'm doing this is to like help bring home his memory. You know, I don't want it stuck up here in the mountains. I don't want people to not know who he was because he was such a great guy. Walking through here, it's kind of like the last piece that I can pick up that I know, you know? I know my final piece is probably sitting in the cemetery waiting for me somewhere, but this is like my last little piece of him alive that I can take back. Owens, Bailey, and Plaskett's bodies were later discovered by shepherds and temporarily buried in a local churchyard in Aronsal, Andorra. And they were requesting my parents what to do with, uh, with his remains. Ne neither of them in very good health. They opted to have him buried over in uh, Belgium. It's the first time I, I'm going to a cemetery. It's your uh, first time ever, huh? An American cemetery. Wow, yeah. Aujourd'hui, uh, je me sens. C'est une sensation bizarre, en fait, d'être ici. Uh, je me sens bien, mais uh, je sais pas, il y, y a une atmosphère, il y, y a quelque chose qui fait que tu as du mal, à, du mal à parler. Voilà, tu as, as besoin d'être besoin seul, besoin de, voilà, de, de te recueillir. Mr. René Mohamed of Liège, Belgium, who adopted Bud Owen's grave, joins the group with his family before their last few steps to meet Bud. Bonjour, Monsieur, Monsieur Mohamed. Monsieur okay. Bonjour. 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 Madame. Bonjour. Madame. Bonjour. Bonjour. Très heureux. Roy, Bonjour. Sam, Louis. Bonjour. Et, uh, shall we go see the grave? Allons-y. 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 Allons Family first. I was really emotional, um, but I was trying not to get so emotional like I did when I saw um, where they found his body, just because Aunt Colleen was there, and I'm always the strong one for my family, so I tried to not be so emotional so that she wasn't so emotional, you know? Um, but. It was definitely like a closure feeling. This is the end of my journey here. I'm glad to have seen his final resting place, if you will. 
made me feel that maybe I really did know him, even though that was impossible. When I was found in front of the tomb, tout de suite j'ai pensé à, à mon arrière grand père je me suis dit voilà ça je sais pas c'est aussi grâce aux américains si, si on est là aujourd'hui j'ai juste voilà, une pensée pour une pensée pour mon arrière grand père une pensée pour les américains juste pour leur dire merci et, et en touchant voilà en touchant la tombe tout à l'heure c'était c'était un signe de reconnaissance de respect juste pour I think I was really quiet all day and just kind of in my head about it because I'm proud of you. This trip taught me a lot and not just about my uncle, you know. I learned about my uncle, but I learned about the kind of person he was and it made me like reconsider myself as a person. So I think today I was just kind of thinking like I can't leave his memory here, so how do I bring it back? You know, I can't just bring it back in stories. So there has to be something about me that I can change or move that I can bring back that'll show how much he taught me without even being here. Something like this just, just makes history come alive. And for a young person who has an interest in history, or maybe again is just interested in some of his family's past, interspersed in any way with the World War II experiences. This this is a terrific way to relive, try to feel what maybe those folks back in the 40s experienced. In the context of, you know, today's society. Uh, you know, a lot of things have happened since World War II. Uh, there's, you know, people of my generation lament the, the apparent lack of uh, character and other things of the current generation. But I've learned, and I think that Francis Owens has taught me, that every generation rises to the occasion that it's needed. Uh, things like duty and uh, uh, devotion and uh, love of country and uh, particularly respect for your fellow man are the things that pop out at me about Francis Owens. Those same traits, I think, are in uh, many, many people you see today, particularly military people, because the kind of character that Owens represents is in every person. It's latently there in every person. And uh, I think the lesson we need to take is that uh, uh, Owens did what he felt he had to do uh, because he had a certain set of values and character. And that, I think, is what we need to make sure all younger generations appreciate and understand.
I think you can see why I consider my little bit in tracing the footsteps of Bud Owens to be one of the finest moments of my life. And I trust that this evening you all learned a few things about the airmen we call our fathers, grandfathers, and grandmothers. <clears throat> and you'll take this lesson home to your own children and grandchildren. Bud Owens represents the finest character of Americans. And as a military man, he deserves our respect, our love, and I think more importantly, the lessons he taught and can teach all of us and our children. Thank you so much this evening. If you have any questions, I'd be glad to take them. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> What cemetery was he buried in? Was that Ardennes? He's the Ardennes, uh, in the Ardennes uh, Cemetery in Liège, Belgium. Uh, he, his remains were discovered by the Army uh, Graves Registration Units in 1949. However, it took until 1951 until he was identified. And at that point in time, as it said in the movies, his parents elected to have him buried at the uh, American Cemetery in the Ardennes. Yes, sir. H hold on one second, and let me get you a microphone. Sorry. The video is currently available on the internet uh, in a presentation I gave to the Yankee Air Force uh, a few years ago. Uh, I have agreed to make the video available uh, to any member of the 8th Air Force Historical Association uh, through your website. And uh, so you will be able to watch it uh, through the website. Tell them who you are. You're oh, Colleen. I'm Colleen Owens Brennan, the niece of Bud Owens. Jim is my father. And it gets me every time I see him trying to hold his emotions uh, when talking about his brother. And number one, I'm so thrilled that Warren and his wife are here tonight because I can't tell you how much the Owens family owes to this gentleman for finally bringing closure to us. We never knew really how Bud died, um, why he died, where he died, and without his research, uh, none of this would have been possible. And I, and I hope you say hello all to my family members, other Owens family, that live in the area, so it was nice we could all get together here tonight to, uh, to pay tribute to my uncle. Um, again, it was emotional. We laughed. We cried. We met many terrific people on as we went through the journey. Everyone who helped, not just my uncle, but so many of the hundreds of downed Allied airmen that they helped what they called the Freedom Trail that eventually get back to England. Um, Again, the purpose why Gert got into this because he believed in preserving a legacy, hoping that the young people today might remember or at least learn about what 18 and 19 year old kids did back in the early 40s for God and country and for their fellow man. So again, I am proud to be part of this association and I really hope that you got something out of this tonight. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Colleen. I, 
she was an inspiration to me as I started getting into some more difficult things. I kept thinking, you know, what does the family want to close on? And they literally didn't know what had happened to Bud. And uh, uh, I was certainly, you know, really motivated by, by your concern and your father's concern and interest and, uh, in fact, uh, your father's older brother when he was living. And so, uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is probably one of the greatest things that you know, I feel has happened to me in my life is that uh, I learned a lot, a lot of things about character and people, and that's why I'm here tonight. Any other questions I can answer for you? Thank you again, and I will be around for the rest of the meeting. Please feel free to grab me if you have a question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.